All right. So let's welcome back to the 30-hour post-licensing course, and we are dealing with our offers and counter-offers, uh, the practicality. We talked about the offer from the side of the seller. We all talked about the offer offer from the side of the buyer. Now we'll get into <clears throat> another responding to these. But before we get started, I do want you to know a very important thing that uh, this is definitely my favorite car. Uh, okay, I just had to put that picture in there. Obviously bright yellow convertible Ferrari probably ranks as anybody's favorite car. So let's talk about responding to the offer. So you've gotten an offer or you've given an offer uh, let's talk about it from the seller side first. The first question that you often ask, or maybe you don't and you should, and one of the things that some sellers say, is there a response even warranted? All right. Now, here's what I mean by that. Sometimes there is an offer that comes from a buyer that is so outlandish, and that could be from the price standpoint, that could be from the, the request standpoint of uh, time to close, the financing, anything like that. And really that's gonna be up to the seller. But let's say you've got a house listed at 100 and they offer $60,000 cash. That offer, while it technically is a valid offer because it meets all of the parts of the offer, may not even deserve or warrant a response from the seller. And the seller may say, we're not even entertaining that. That's not even realistic in the park and don't worry about it. Now, probably not one of the most preferable things as an agent, you kind of want to be professional, but remember we're guiding, uh, we're guided by our client. And there is that whole thing that we've talked about once before about legal, ethical, and nice. All right, there are no ethic rules that say you cannot, that you have to respond. It's not nice, you know, you probably should say, hey, it's been rejected, but certainly it's not a violation of any ethics rules if you just don't answer, all right? So remember that legal, ethical, and nice are two completely different things. Now, if you, what happens if you're given a time frame with which is ridiculous in the response? And in these hot markets, I have seen offers that have been submitted at six, seven o'clock at night and literally given to midnight to answer. Now, that might seem ridiculous. And on the surface, I think it is, especially if you're doing it like on a Friday evening and you know, families may be out uh, homeowners may be out on a date, maybe out with their spouse in a movie, who knows? So there may come a time when you have to extend the time frame to with which to respond. Now, that time frame can be given by the buyer once you just reply, hey, t time is extended to so and so. Now, here, well, let's go back to this question that we have talked about the other day. I'm going to hide that for a second because we talked about this concept of amending versus writing new. Can I amend or can I write it new? And what I mean by this is there are some people, let's say they got their deadline was at 7 p.m. and they counter back at 8 p.m. and the first thing they write is extend the offer to 8.01. So now your eight o'clock counter is actually inside of this new time frame to offer. All right. <clears throat> My attorney has told me that this is not the preferred way because you are actually writing the counter after it expires, all right? So you really can't unexpire something. So you would actually have to, inside of this time frame, 
ask to amend to 9 p.m. or till tomorrow to whatever. But you would have to do that inside of this time frame, okay? <clears throat> now, sometimes that can actually be done without your client. Let's say you can't get a hold of your client, so you actually send back, you know, an extension for a time. That can be done, all right? So just keep that in mind that uh, based on my attorney, I'm sure you could probably get an attorney to say something different for you, um, but you cannot write that and base that extension and unexpire a property that way, all right? <clears throat> so as you can see, there are three responses that can be given to the offer. It can be accepted. <clears throat> and we have talked about this before. When does the word acceptance takes place? Remember, acceptance means both parties know. So in other words, <clears throat> they send over an offer, you guys sign the offer, and you got to send it back to them. Send it back so that they know. That is the definition of acceptance. And we work under that mailbox rule. The mailbox rule says the one, the second you send it and it hits their inbox, it's considered delivered and accepted by them. Even though your client or even though the other agent may not see it for 20 minutes, two hours, <clears throat> and then he has to pass it to the client, the client may not see it for another hour. That is not sufficient for them to say, Oh, I didn't see it to two. Even though my agent got it at 11.30 this morning, it doesn't count to I No, he's the agent and we work under the posting rule. And the posting rule says as soon as it posts or postmarked is where it came from. Some people call it the mailbox rule. As soon as I mail it, it was considered received. So even though the agent got it at 9.30 in the morning accepting the offer, he didn't read it till 9.45. He didn't pass it to the seller till 11 a.m. It's considered received at 9.30 when it hit your inbox, all right? So then you have to ask, what is the next step for the client? And we have got this over here. <clears throat> now, this is not supposed to be an exhaustive list. So don't write this down and hang your hat on it. These are the most typical things. If you're the seller, obviously, once you accept it, your next gig is to just pretty much wait because now all you do is wait for the seller to schedule. I'm sorry, you are the seller. You wait for the buyer to schedule the inspection and you allow them to come in for the inspection response. So you're all you're basically doing now in this time frame is kind of in a holding pattern waiting. Is there title work? Well, as you can see, I wrote this word because it depends. Have you already ordered the preliminary title work? You may not have to do that. If you uh, have let the buyer choose the title work, then that may be over here for him. Then basically you wait till they have the inspection. You respond to the buyer's inspection response and you do the repairs if there are repairs and then you go to closing now there could be a detour right here when you're responding to the buyers and the inspection and the response because it's highly possible that something happens and you don't end up doing the deal so you got to start all back over again all right from the buyer side obviously as soon as the buyer gets an accepted offer, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is contact your mortgage loan originator or your broker or your lender and get them a copy of the purchase agreement so they can start their process of the underwriting and getting all the documents. You're going to have to contact the title company, maybe, because it depends if you're going with the seller's title work and the prelim may already be done. You are definitely probably going to have to help your client get their inspection, and you have a time frame with which to do that, remember, 
because you filled it out in the offer. Once the inspection comes back, you are then going to do this very crucial here and do a buyer's inspection response. They're going to do the repairs, and then I always suggest that you should do a reinspection. And if everything goes right, then you close. Of course, on your side, you have the same issue that during this time frame, something may happen and the deal doesn't close. All right. So that's the basic anatomy from that side of an acceptance. You can actually flat out reject the offer. There is a box that allows you to reject it, reject it. Now, a pocket rejection very much if you're into politics is what they call like a pocket veto. A pocket veto is where there's a deadline on it and you let the deadline elapse without saying yes or no. So by default, you're saying no. And this goes back up to this whole question about, was there even a response warranted? You know, that may be such a silly offer and they've given you four hours and at 10 p.m. at night when your time frame, you just let it blow through and never respond to it, that would be considered a pocket rejection. And then there's that whole topic that we just talked about. How do you convey the rejection to the buyer? You actually should put rejected and send back to the buyer. Check counter, send the counter back to the buyer. There have been times when my seller has gotten so upset that he literally told me not to contact the buyer. Once again, not truly unethical, but yet not nice, okay? And then obviously the other thing that can happen is the counter that we have spoke about and the counter is a death of the original offer. So once the counter has been written and submitted to the other side, that original offer has been canceled. Now there has been a question um, to this and once again, understand I'm not a practicing attorney, so Follow me here. Buyer writes an offer to the seller. Seller counters. That counter means rejection of the original offer. What happens if the seller rescinds the offer or rescinds the counter does that then, in essence, uncancel the original offer? The attorney that I spoke with said most vehemently, no. That once you write the offer, it's dead, and you can't unexpire, which expire means to die, an offer. Back to what we just talked about in the last lesson about uh, unexpiring an offer in the counter. You cannot also rescind that counter to resuscitate that original offer because the act of writing it and delivering it counters or kills this deal. So you cannot unexpire a counter either through negotiation or through a recension. Okay? Now, uh, so we have talked about the buyer side and the seller side. We've talked a little bit about offers and counter offers and their practicality. Remember, if you have any questions, you can always email me at raymond at realuniversity.com. Hold on, we're going to wrap this uh, course up. Tell you what, I think we could probably just move on and stretch it out here. So here's some things I want you to do. I want you to speak to some of the experienced agents that you know about writing offers. Ask them their concepts and mindsets about time frames and counter offers and what process they follow. Do they have a written uh, flow chart, so to speak? Ask other team members who have written contracts and to help you or give you some advice to gain some insight on a successfully written purchase agreement. Now, you could also go the other way with this. I don't know how successful this would be. 
you could have someone help you and say, hey, do you have an offer that wasn't accepted? Let me see what it said. Maybe I can see where it went wrong. You know, maybe I can see the time frame versus the hair, and that's why you got zero or zero response, all of that. You can also talk to your managing broker about some tips that he would suggest. Obviously, as the managing broker, they've got a number of years and a number of deals experience, so they could also probably give you some insight on that as well. So writing an offer is a complex issue. It has many dinner interactive parts, and we talked about that. When you write the offer might be dependent on what type of offer you're writing and how you're writing it. So they all interact and work with each other. You need to understand the key issues that can affect the rest of the purchase agreement. When you write it may affect your response. If you wrote it immediately, you could get a better response if the market's hot. If you take time to write it and you've let them think about it and it's been on the market with no activity and all of a sudden you come in as the knight in shining armor, that's also a strategy. Make sure that you write the best offer you can to protect your client because ultimately that is the single biggest thing that you need to be doing is to exercise reasonable skill and care to make sure your client does not get harmed in the process. All right, hold on, we're gonna change slides and get, keep going with this great class.